Okay, well, let's dive in, Isaac. Um, you're at the COP27 at the moment. Tell me a little bit about the role, relevance, and the impact of risk pools in the climate crisis as you are at COP and what you've been hearing. Thank you for this opportunity, um, you know, to share with you uh, my perspectives on, on um, the risk pools and the, certainly the role that we've been playing. But I, I usually like to answer this question in the context of, obviously, of CRIF, the role that we are playing in the Caribbean, Central America, um, our relevance to our members, our footprints, our impact. Uh, as you know, uh, the very location and geography of our member countries in the Caribbean and Central America makes us particularly vulnerable. I think that has been well established. Uh, vulnerable to, to natural hazards, uh, 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 meteorological events such as hurricane, excess rainfall and drought. Um, in these two regions, there still exists undesirable levels of, of, of poverty. And, you know, clearly this is an area of, of major concern. Also, the question of financing is key uh, because at the end of the day, you do need the financial resources to be able to combat, combat those climate risks. So the concept of risk pooling in the Caribbean really began following a major hurricane I, um, event in the year 2004 called Hurricane Ivan, which actually devastated a number of countries, but more especially Grenada, and, and the Cayman Islands causing losses of over 200% of GDP in those two countries. In fact, the total losses for that single hurricane event throughout the Caribbean was actually uh, over $6 billion. And that in itself really represented uh, a wake up call uh, to the government to the extent that they recognized the need to, to come up with some kind of risk financing facility and which led to the creation of CRIF after consultation with the World Bank and, and, and of course, with the support of, of the donors. Um, but it is really important to make the point that there is enough scientific evidence to indicate that climate change is increasing, not just in frequency, but um, in intensity. And, you know, it is very clear. I mean, just more recently, um, and I'm talking about as recent as last week, there was a very unusual rainfall flooding event in my own country, St. Lucia, uh, which impacted a relatively small part of the country, but was so devastating for people, for households, and clearly left a significant bill um, for the government. So we, more and more, we are seeing these kinds of events and is obviously creating an issue. Uh, and so we know that many countries have limited fiscal space and it is really important for them to be able to come up with any mechanism. As somebody who worked in the Ministry of Finance in St. Lucia, I must say that, you know, you know, we, we really, it's really important for us to move away from the practice of, of just being able to reallocate a budget in order to be able to finance um, a, a major catastrophe or, or be able to just to depend on the benevolence, you know, of, of maybe other governance and so on. So we do have to take proactive measures. And this is what a risk pooling is about, where we are be able to, to bring um, a number of countries under a single diversified portfolio that can provide an insurance product to help countries combat, as I said, not just climate risks, but other types of risks such as um, earthquake, which is uh, clearly a big issue in the, in the, in the, um, in the Caribbean and Central America. So overall, our impact and the footprint in the Caribbean and Central America um, has been that number one, we have 24 members. Uh, we actually increase our membership from, from 16 um, to, to, to 24. Well, in terms of member countries, we are a total of 22. And because we now offer what we call a, a, a product for transmission and distribution, we now have um, two utility companies. Uh, I'm pleased to say that we've been able, for the last three years, um, that member governments have been able to transfer over $1 billion um, in risk to CRIF. Uh, and that represents a very significant increase from the half a billion that it was in the year 2007. And also we've been able to make 58 payouts to 16 member governments totaling $260 million. Um, when we first started off CRIF, we had uh, we offered tropical cyclone 
and and um, an earthquake. Now we we subsequently added excess rainfall, and I'm pleased to say that we do offer a product which is really designed for the fishery sector, uh, more specifically benefiting the fisher folk who are involved in in that sector. And it's called the, the coast. And of course, as I indicated a while ago, um, we offer a product for transmission and distribution. And finally, um, to make the point that uh, when you consider uh, the amount of payouts that we have made over the years, our analysis suggests that over 3.5 million persons have actually benefited uh, from a population of, of $50 million. So clearly, um, it is very it, it is noteworthy the role that uh, risk pools such as CRIF is actually playing. And I think the time has come now for us to be able to scale up so that we could amplify, you know, the benefits to member governments as well as the various people that it serve. That's a significant impact uh, that CRIF has had um, on the on the region. Um, Leslie, if I could just turn over to you, because this year, 2022, has been quite a year for Arc Limited as well. And the extent to which um, Arc Limited's impact on the continent has been felt. I know your ambitions um, currently are to diversify your product as well, as Isaac was talking, that they have diversified theirs, but also to cover uh, millions of Africans that are not being covered currently um, through through the good work that ARC is doing. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, this year has been one of the most significant years in the history of ARC. Uh, we have paid out uh, over $60 million uh, in claims relating to both drought and tropical uh, cyclones. Maybe starting with drought, uh, the levels of drought in Africa have been unprecedented because we've had three major drought systems. One uh, in the West Africa, so in Mali, in Mauritania, uh, in Niger, in parts of Togo, uh, and in parts of Burkina Faso as well. Uh, we've also had a devastating drought in Eastern Africa, in Somalia, in Ethiopia, in northern Kenya and parts of Sudan. Similarly, there's been another drought system in southern Africa, in Malawi, in Zambia, in Zimbabwe, uh, and in Madagascar as well. Uh, also in Madagascar, we had the uh, devastating uh, tropical cyclone, tropical cyclone uh, Batsirai. So all these uh, events uh, have led to payments of claims uh, on the part of ARC, uh, this year, we have paid $60 million uh, in claims, and uh, we have managed to have uh, a positive impact in terms of cutting down the response time and making funding more available on a timely uh, basis for African uh, governments. But it does highlight the need for insurance to uh, be expanded and to be more accessible to the countries uh, to deal with the increasing frequency and severity of natural disasters. At the level of ARC, uh, we are providing insurance to about 30 million people per year on the African uh, continent, but we estimate that there are 700 million people that need uh, insurance uh, coverage, given that their economic activities can be easily disrupted by uh, extreme uh, weather. So our ambition is really to scale up what we are doing uh, significantly uh, to cover the whole continent in what we call the covering the continent uh, uh, st strat strategy, because we believe that insurance uh, is crucial uh, to making funding available to the people that need it uh, in a very timely and efficient manner. Insurance works much better than traditional humanitarian assistance which can take anywhere up to nine months uh, to mobilize and to deliver uh, uh, to people. Our insurance programs uh, typically pay out claims within 10 days of an event happening. In the case of Madagascar, we're able to pay the tropical cyclone claim within four days, which then gave the government the first liquidity that they needed to mount an effective uh, response. Then in the context of COP27, uh, where we are uh, today, uh, the question that we ask ourselves continuously is what it will take to scale up 
uh, insurance coverage and make it mainstream all across Africa. The reason why scaling up is important is firstly, so that we have a much greater impact and a much greater relevance to the needs of Africa. Secondly, uh, scaling up is important so that we achieve diversification. Diversification is at the bedrock of insurance because the premiums of the many are used to pay the claims of the few. So therefore, we will be much stronger and more financially sustainable as an institution uh, if we're covering uh, more uh, people. And the ingredients uh, to making uh, scaling up insurance a success lie first in partnerships, which is also why I'm really delighted to be on the panel with my fellow risk pool CEOs, because we need partnerships across the public sector, across the private sector, uh, partnerships to improve collection and management of data, partnership to innovate on the products that we have, and partnerships uh, with governments in order to make uh, insurance more accessible and more available to the people that need it. Uh, secondly, uh, we need uh, premium subsidies, uh, especially in the case of Africa, because for countries to pay premiums, they, they have limited fiscal space and the payment of insurance premiums competes against other national priorities, such as putting books in schools, putting medication in the hospitals, uh, building uh, uh, roads and other, inf and other infrastructure, uh, and also the country has to then uh, pay premiums. So we have been uh, in discussions uh, with the donors and the developmental financial institutions to say that the development of the insurance market has to be supported by the availability of premium uh, subsidies. And we are also pleased that a number of uh, donors have stepped up, such as uh, KFW uh, from Germany, FCDO in the UK, SDC uh, in Switzerland, uh, and uh, USID uh, in the United States. And we are seeing a gathering of momentum uh, towards uh, the support for insurance uh, premiums. Uh, which is also helpful uh, in the context of the loss and damage discussion, even though the two are not directly related, but having insurance available as a mechanism then is also extremely helpful to the countries that are suffering from the impact of increasing frequency and severity of natural disasters. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. I'll, I'll bring Lotto in here. You're representing the island nations of the Pacific, and Leslie was talking about partnerships and the importance of partnerships. Um, I know that the risk pools have have formed a, an informal partnership. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Thank you, uh, Natalie, for that. And I think <clears throat> we are one uh, of the risk pool that created after the, the Caribbean and Africa. Uh, we are just about 60 years old now. So, and because we are a very young company established in the Pacific, uh, we were more like looking forward to, to, to kind of some political support from our countries in the Pacific, but to also uh, connect with our risk pool outside the Pacific so that we can be able to leverage on their experience and their expertise and how to drive this going forward. But let me let me start by saying, uh, you know, giving some sort of a context of these conversations, uh, really, that leads to the reasons of the establishment of, of BICRIC in the first place. The recent uh, 2021 IPCC report on climate change highlighted that the Pacific Island countries expect to see several several uh, challenges. One is the increases in extreme rain, rain frequency and intensity. The other one is increasing in agricultural and ecological drought, uh, to name a few increases in intensity of tropical cyclones. So pretty much, you know, <clears throat> in this context, this is more like a confirmation that we are continuing as a region, we are continuing to bear the brunt of the climate change, increasing disaster risk. And it's becoming more clear that our nations can no longer depend on international aid 
when a disaster strike. So, and obviously what, what the IPCC has articulated in their report is also a confirmation that, and also highlight that numbers of our Pacific Island countries have been identified they are the most vulnerable countries in the whole world to the impact of climate change. So that's also give us an idea in the Pacific that we have to move, start moving away from being reactive to be, to strengthen our proactive approach to disaster risk management and its financing requirement. And that was the reasons why we end up having uh, our leaders back in 2015 to adopt the establishment of the company, the Pacific Catastrophe Risk Insurance Company. It was more like uh, copy the model that uh, the Caribbeans, uh, because they already uh, established and operated at the time. So the World Bank was fully behind this in supporting the establishment, more like trying to copy the model, uh, the business model that being utilized or being used, being operated with the Caribbean to the Pacific. In 2015, uh, the decision, the finance minister in the Pacific agreed to establish the company, and the company has been, uh, was established in 2016, Thomas Stahl in Cook Island. And currently, we are only having six members of the councils, and we only have three policy holders. There's a reason why, you know, the whole political uptake or members, uh, increase in membership of the company, because the current product that we have right now is only two products, vis-a-vis -vis the, the ARC and the, uh, the Caribbean. Uh, they are more advanced in terms of their product development and their model uh, constructions, you know, because they've been uh, established for, for quite some time now. So those two current products that we are having right now, it's the cyclone and the earthquake, and it's more relevant to the South Pacific, that the country, they are prone to cyclone and earthquake. While the North Pacific, they are not prone to cyclone and earthquake. They are more prone to uh, drought, and, and flooding in terms of um, you know storm surge or lack of um, um, or excess rainfall coming to the countries because they are other countries. So as you can see, that's the reasons why we need to partnership with other risk pool in terms of strengthening our our, our our energy in terms of looking at the experience, utilize the expertise, because we are currently developing two products now: the drought and excess rainfall that's related to flooding. So we are hoping those two new products will come roll out to the market around March next year. So that's that's where we are. But when I took over this position, Dandaria, in 2020, let me tell you, the, the political visibility of the company were near zero, or perhaps zero, or perhaps maybe under zero at the time. Because the World Bank were finding it difficult at the time. We are diff I mean, you're having some challenges at the time to, uh, to engage a CEO, or to get the, you know, the, the company uh, up and running, simply because at the time it was just the first five years of the company, I, I have to say, uh, we are in six years now, the first four years of the company was more like um, experimental stage process of the company. In the last two years when I took over, that's when we start having this political outreaching, reaching out to our risk pool, reaching out to other corporate institutions is also reaching out to our countries, our key stakeholders, which are the countries. So, and, and that's, we, we, as of now, we are kind of some very strong political support now, but we are waiting to see that strong political support to be translated into increase in membership, which we are working towards, working hard towards that. So cooperation with our key risk pool, cooperation with the countries, reaching out to other organizations also that they you know, give us a support to, to go out to the countries. It's a key for our sustainability and our service that we offer to the countries in the regions. There were two key issues when I consulted the Pacific countries. There are 14 of them, and I consulted 10 countries of them uh, already. Uh, two key issues came out for, for during that consultation that we had with them. One is the affordability of the premium. Second is the lack of technical understanding of the service that we offer to the countries. So we are working hard now to see if we can offer some sort of an educational platform together with other organizations that are helping us in terms of developing some knowledge product, running seminars, webinars, or in offering intensive, offering scholarship, just to build that understanding in this space. Because the, when we talk about insurance in the Pacific, for them it's more like a cost. Oh, oh, that's going to cost me. They don't see that as the benefit. They don't see this as benefit because the reactiveness attitude 
has been well embedded in us in the Pacific. We have to slowly use the company to change. It's, it's more like a platform to change that mindset, to move away from reactive to become more proactive. And that's when they will understand using insurance as a climate change adaptation. Currently, we are working closely with, with Willis and Tower to drill up our, our drug product. And the thinking behind it, when after consultations in Tonga two weeks ago, we're thinking of an early trigger and a later trigger. An early trigger meaning before any national declarations of a national emergency, at least we 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 uh we pay out the countries during that we I mean that early trigger. And that's related to also to loss and damage. If we provide the trigger right before any disaster strike, that will prevent the risk from becoming a crisis, and that will also prevent the damage and the loss created by disaster when it strikes. So that, that's more like uh, we are trying to see if we can connect with the loss and damage conversations that are currently ongoing now here in the in the COP, and we see whether the service that we are providing is relevant to the whole conversation in COP, because we try to be to make ourselves more relevant and more impactful when we provide our service to the countries and the regions. I'll stop there, Natalia. Thank you, Lotu. Gary, I'm going to pull you into the conversation um, and uh, listening to Lotu and kind of what keeps him up at night, I wonder if you have the same the same worries on your mind, the first around diversifying your product um, and having the right product, in fact, in place for uh, Southeast Asia, which is the region you represent, but also secondly, this lack of understanding of um, risk finance and, and a proactive disaster risk management approach. Is that what keeps you up at mind? Tell me a little bit about what's happening in the world of CDRF. Well, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. And um, I must say, I sympathize enormously with what uh, Lotto has just said. And um, indeed, we're in his first four year period, <clears throat> a chaotic period that he uh, experienced himself. So we're the baby in these uh, four organizations. We were only established in 2019 and we issued our first product in February 2021, which was a flood risk product for Laos. And yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, of course, the, the region that I represent, um, it's very diverse. Um, you've got uh, some very big countries, for example, Philippines and Indonesia, which are a lot further down the track, I think, in disaster risk um, finance. And then you've got smaller countries uh, such as uh, Laos, Cambodia, um, who uh, are perhaps um, a little less far down the track. So we've got a substantial challenge in trying to bring those countries together. And yes, you're absolutely right. We have a, we're still in the stage of having a very big challenge in communicating to the countries the benefits of insurance. Um, and substantially, we're looking at parametric insurance. And that's not an easy concept um, for uh, governments to understand initially. Uh, and as um, Lotto has said, um, there's, a, there's a real issue in persuading the countries, the countries that I represent, of the benefit of parametric insurance. I think their uh, initial reaction is that it's a cost and uh, they're not sure that they can justify that cost uh, and they're really dealing with disasters on a, a hand-to-mouth emergency basis. And um, there's less time and space to consider planning or to consider concepts of um, pooling with other countries uh, and to consider uh, concepts of um, perhaps um, less frequent payouts. Um, so yes, um, both, those, both those issues um, are real issues uh, for, for us. So I'll, I'll stop there. <clears throat> Thank you, Gary. Um, just talking about disaster risk finance in the um, context of DRM, and if I, I wonder if I can ask Isaac to lean in here. Talk to me a little bit about, we've just been speaking about this lack of understanding, and I know that this is just one tool in an arsenal um, of disaster risk management, but we've spoken about it they're not being a good understanding of it. Are you seeing that evolving? You're at COP27 now. Are people understanding the, the role and the potential of DRF in the context of DRM? Or do we still have a lot of work to go? 
Yeah, well, first of all, let me start by saying that I think there is this, um, there has always been this false notion that disaster risk financing falls outside of comprehensive disaster risk um, management. And, you know, I, I really think that that notion um, should be dispelled. Uh, but having said all of this, as I indicated earlier, I mean, going back to my own experience uh, working in the Ministry of Finance, where, you know, the emphasis was more on, you know, you, you're impacted by a major event. We now need to determine how to finance. And this is not peculiar to my own country, but all countries, that we reallocate the budget or we depend on, we make an appeal for support. We, are, we have come a long way. And so we really see that disaster risk financing is really a, a, a very important or a key component of comprehensive disaster risk financing. Um, you know, as you know, there are a number of, well, five key pillars of, of disaster risk financing or comprehensive disaster risk financing. There's the, the aspect of, of risk diversification, which deals more with the, mod, the risk modeling and the hazard mapping, so the social perceptions and so on. There's a risk reduction, which focuses more on risk mitigation activities, strengthening business goals, education awareness. Um, there's also the preparedness, which deals with uh, alerts and early warning systems. And of course, the post disaster risk, um, reconstruction. And of course, as we are saying, financial protection, uh, such as risk transfer mechanisms, such as what we are responsible as risk, uh, risk pools, there's also the disaster risk financing instruments and so on. So given where we were at one time when CRIF was established in 2007, um, to today, I think we have made a lot of progress um, in, in this particular area. Um, but of course, there's need for more, more work, uh, as has already been highlighted. What we are witnessing with the advent of climate change is the increasing frequency and severity of climate um, events forcing governments to consider new ways of meeting the financial consequences of the of natural disasters. And that has actually resulted in growing interest um, in implementing, for example, uh, sovereign disaster risk financing and insurance facilities, a number of such initiatives. Uh, and this has also resulted in tremendous growth in the number and types of financial and budgetary instruments available. And, and you would have heard about the, the, the launch of, of the of, of, of the, the um, climate shield. We, there are a number of very important events um, that's that's basic. So uh, there's no question in my mind um, that we are actually seeing progress. We're seeing that disaster risk finan financing is promoting comprehensive financial protection strategies to ensure that governments, uh, homeowners, small and medium-sized enterprise, agricultural producers, and the most vulnerable population can meet the, the post-disaster needs. But it's actually going to take some time. I mean, when you when you really consider all of what's been happening today, we're still seeing that the protection gap still remains significant. Uh, and that is because while we are trying to make progress on a number of fronts in the whole area of disaster risk financing, climate change continues and it's continue and sometimes even to undermine or to reverse much of the gains. So it's a, almost like a constant um, moving target. Fighting climate change, we're making progress, but we're still having to continue to deal with, with some of those issues. But I, I will stop here for now. But just to make the point, yes, we have, in fact, made a, fair, a fairly significant amount of progress in, in the area of, of disaster risk and financing. Uh, Isaac, you mentioned uh, the Global Shield Against Climate Risks. And Leslie, I know that you uh, spoke at an event at COP27 yesterday um, that launched it and, and created awareness of the financial protection needs of the V20. Uh, tell me a little bit about that Global sh Shield. What, what would success look like in your view? So then maybe I will start with the problem that the Global Shield uh, uh, is seeking to address. Uh, so firstly, I think as we have all discussed, uh, there is a need for much greater financing uh, to be available in the proactive disaster risk financing uh, space. I think countries need to systematically move from the traditional pro uh, uh, reactive approach to a more proactive approach. And the Global Shield really seeks to accelerate uh, that uh, transition. 
Secondly, uh, in the context of the, uh, of the Global uh, Shield, there have been a number of initiatives launched by different donor countries, by different multilateral uh, institutions. And what the Global Shield will seek to do is to streamline all those initiatives such that there is much greater coherence uh, and therefore much greater impact from the various initiatives that have been uh, that have been launched. Uh, on our side, the African RISI, we are excited by the launch of the uh, a Global Shield, but then we are also uh, have some degree of trepidation because the proof is going to be uh, in the pudding, so we have to see how it actually uh, works. Uh, they have launched a path of them in that, in, in that way, and the two countries in Africa are Senegal and Ghana. So uh, we will be working uh, with those two countries uh, just to try out the Global Shield and see what needs to be changed or what can be improved before uh, it's uh, uh, rolled out to uh, uh, the, the various uh, countries. Uh, we are also pleased that uh, the work of the Global Shield uh, has involved the uh, V20, uh, the vulnerable 20 uh, countries, which then uh, takes into account uh, their input and also their specific concerns. So it's not just designed by the donors and imposed on the countries. Uh, there has been an extensive consultation uh, process, and uh, we are uh, uh, really pleased to see that. And it goes back to what I was saying earlier about this need to have uh, a partnership approach and to be coordinated in the way we go about uh, solving uh, the, uh, these issues. And then maybe just to add on to what uh, Isaac was, uh, was, was, was talking about uh, in terms of just increasing the available instruments for dealing with uh, climate change. Uh, at the African Risk Capacity, we've uh, looked at it uh, along two domains. Firstly, the supply side, we have uh, increased the number of perils that we uh, are able to insure. Historically, we had only insured drought because this was the prevalent climate risk African continent. Last few years, we have launched our tropical cyclone uh, product and also our flood insurance uh, product. And now with these three perils, we're covering uh, the most common uh, weather-related perils on the African continent, which is in response to uh, a need by our member states. Uh, secondly, on the supply side, we've also worked on increasing the instruments that are available to help our countries uh, deal uh, with an, uh, extreme weather. So in addition to our insurance product, we now offer a contingency fund. So this is a savings fund into which a country pays into. And uh, then uh, whenever an event happens, that's not severe enough to trigger the payment of a claim the country can then draw on the savings that they have uh, built up in the savings fund. But the way the funds are accessed is based on a trigger. So it's systematic uh, in the way the funds are, are, are accessed. And this helps us separate insurance and the savings fund because historically countries had wanted to use insurance as an instrument to cover all kinds of uh, extreme weather events but insurance lends itself towards the events that are more severe and less frequent. And for the events that are more frequent and less severe, then a contingency uh, a savings fund is a more appropriate instrument. Uh, on the demand side, uh, we have worked at ARC to increase the number of members uh, uh, for ARC because uh, ARC is a treaty-based institution. So countries have to express an interest in becoming uh, members of uh, of ARC, and currently we are at 35 members out of uh, 55 countries uh, on the African continent. So a lot done, but a lot more to do. And then uh, also on the demand side, we have increased the client segments uh, that we are working in. So we now have uh, a dedicated insurance program for humanitarian agencies, the World Food Program, uh, the Stack Network, and various other non-governmental organizations. Uh, because these institutions also have to 
scale up their operations uh, in African countries after there's been a, an extreme weather event to complement and supplement uh, the government's uh, own response. Uh, we have uh, also worked with financial institutions on creating uh, excess default type products so that financial institutions are able to increase the lending uh, into the agricultural uh, sector, because as you expect, there will be an increase in the level of defaults uh, if there is a, a drought. And that increase in defaults, we can model back and cover through insurance. So we're also facilitating access to uh, financing. And then also we have launched uh, a reinsurance program for small to medium scale farmers working in partnership with local insurance companies on the African uh, our continent, so that we're also able to increase the number of people that we're covering and also increase the availability uh, and affordability of uh, insurance. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Um, Lottie, I've just been listening to Leslie talk about a lot of things that ARC's doing to um, scale risk financing on the African continent. I know you mentioned some of the things that you're doing on your side, but I wonder if I could ask you to explain to me what are some of the barriers that we experience as risk pools to scaling um, risk finance? You know, Leslie makes it sound easy, but I know there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes um, that everybody in this room is doing to scale disaster risk financing. What are some of the barriers? How are you, how are you bashing them down? Well, thank you, thank you, uh, Nadali, for that. And I think I also mentioned this during my early remarks: the lack of, uh, or the hindrance, or the lack of understanding of uh, disaster risk finance or the service that we offer the countries. That's one of the hindrances that you know hindering us in terms of uh, uh, increasing the uptake of membership. Uh, you know, that's that's one key area also. But let me, I, I couldn't agree more with what uh, um, Isaac is saying and also what Leslie is saying in terms of the disaster refinance, it's becoming to position itself within the DRM arena. But the lack of understanding that, uh, you know, on the technicality behind it, that's where it hinges us in the context of the Pacific. But let me, let me share with you, because when I contacted consultations with the Pacific in the region, some of the messages that I got from the countries, they were saying, hey, are you guys duplicating what the World Bank Cat TDO is offering to the market, offering to the countries. You know, the Cat TDO is one instrument within just a risk finance. Are you duplicating or you are competing with what ADB is offering as part of the contingency financing uh, to the countries? So are you doing what the Red Cross are currently working on in terms of forecast-based financing? Are you doing what UNDP is working on in terms of anticipatory financing? So this all these financing instruments are emerging or already exist, creates a confusion mentality on the ground for, for the country, based, I mean, for the countries or people on the ground. So that's the first thing that I have to really explain it to them, you know, the, particularly the officials in the Ministry of Finance, because, you know, us in the Ministry of Finance and, and, and uh, Isaac can relate it to this, because I also used to be the CEO of Finance back in my home country, you know, we're dealing with public finance management, which is a humongous machinery. And disaster risk finance is an element of that machinery. But at the time, disaster risk finance was not something that we were, you know, have that better understanding as of now. So I have to spend a lot of time, Nadalia, to really explain the demarcations of what the service that we offer to the countries and what the World Bank is offering. We are not duplicating, we are not competing, we are addressing a different entry point. And for the countries to understand, that's because what we offer to the market, what we offer to the Pacific, is not a panacea. It's not gonna. It's not the only solution. So I had to spend some time trying to explain it to them that our service premise on a scalable solution, which I classified into three areas: scale up, scale out, scale deep. Scale up meaning that whatever the discussions in the country in terms of disaster risk finance related to climate change, we are also part of that policy consideration. We are also part of that policy conversation. Scaling up meaning, uh, scaling out meaning that the service that we offer to the countries, it not only go to the government, but it's rich to everyone in the whole economy, regardless whether you are civil society, private sector, vulnerable groups, you know, that's the service, that's, that's more like the scalable solutions that we offer to the country based on scaling out. Scaling team, 
We also use our company platform to also slowly change the mindset to move away from being reactive to proactive. You know, because it's in the DNA of the Pacific. You know, let me, I grew up in the Pacific. It's in the DNA. Oh, just wait, because if there's a cyclone strike, Australia, New Zealand, US, they will fly in their Hercules with all the in-kind assistance. Don't worry about it. Why pay? Why pay, pay insurance? Why pay? Why try to be prepared? So it's in the mindset. There is a moral hazard attitude, you know, because of it creates because of humanitarian assistance being provided. And that's changed the mindset of the people. So I'm working hard in terms of trying to change this mindset. Let's be prepared. Prepared in terms of paying your premium is not a cost. You are paying your premium, you are investing this because down the road, if there's a disaster strike, you will access to this facility, I mean, to this facility liquidity within 10 days. And that will help you with your response immediate response to your disaster, post-disaster situation. And that will also protect the fiscal balance of your government or resources that have been allocated within your budget. And that a risk transferring. You know, they, they yet to really understand the risk transfer mechanisms. They're still in this risk retention uh, mentality. Ah, don't worry about it. If this disaster strike, we just reallocate resources here and there. So that's the mentality that I, I wanted the company to, to use the platform that we are having right now to change that mindset. But before to change that mindset, we have to strengthen our political footprint on each country in the Pacific. And we are working hard. The last two years, it was difficult because of COVID. I didn't, you know, I couldn't be able to visit them, but I'm already starting my country engagement in person with the countries. And I can see there is some changes in terms of attitude, in terms of looking at us, oh no, no, here's the insurance, here's the insurance, because they look at the insurance as a cost and they want to run away. No, 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 no. It's, it's it's different. We what we are offering is different from from traditional insurance. So I that's what I wanted to to add on that. Thank no, you. That's it's it's a human affliction, you know. Not thinking about it doesn't matter. It does not just the Pacific. I think Leslie, you can agree. Africa, not <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. We completely understand and we relate um, completely to what you're saying. Um, I think so. You know, taking it back to COP and this Global Shield and the awareness. Um, that Global Shield um, against climate risk is going to create. And Gary, I'm going to come to you. Hopefully this is something that will be, you know, on the agenda, will be spoken about a lot more. There will be a greater unpacking of it. So, you know, having that Global Shield against climate risks initiative behind it, surely that would elevate it to the extent where it becomes a conversation that's a little bit more mainstream and understood by um, government officials. And then Leslie was saying the proof is in the pudding. It always is when it comes to these um, COP discussions. What would need to be true for that pudding to be sweet, Gary? Well, I, I think um, I think probably we're all very conscious that one of the major problems is the slowness of um, things happening. Uh, it takes an awful long time to get decisions. Um, and, um, it, it, you know, it's understandable in the public space, um, you're dealing with public money. So um, you know, there has to be due diligence. But I do worry that um, process uh, sometimes takes precedence over substance. And um, I, I do believe that this comes back to political leadership. And I think uh, from, from where I stand, what we so badly need uh, are um, leaders, political leaders, who will put these issues absolutely center stage. And my concern really is that when you go away from something like um, COP, and I think we did see it after COP26, that this goes down the political agenda. It doesn't get um, bandwidth, it doesn't get time. Um, and somehow, um, I mean, and maybe the very fact of the frequency and severity of events will push it up the agenda. But I do very much worry that there's, there still is a lack of um, political will to really um, push uh, these um, solutions through. And um, yeah, I mean, the Global global Fund, the Global Shield um, is something, um, is, is very promising and, and we hope sort of um, something comes from it. 
but it does seem to be uh, incredibly slow in happening. And um, of course, we all know the disasters are happening now. This is not something for the future. And uh, we're all, I mean, we're all very conscious of what's happening in Somalia at the moment. And so the, these are things that are happening at the moment and they do require um, not necessarily solutions because I, I don't think we're ever going to solve say the funding gap um, but because it's just too big. Um, and uh, uh, as has been said, it, it, it's growing all the time. But we have to start to make um, inroads and provide solutions to people. The other thing that really worries me is um, the growing disjunct between people and governments. And we're seeing this, we're seeing this in the UK and I'm sure it's happening in many countries, the issue of direct action that peoples are becoming disenchanted. They're um, losing faith in governments and people like us to provide um, solutions. So I do think that it's extremely important that we engage um, uh, with I mean, you know, the young and, and, and what's going on in the develop, uh, develop action world. <clears throat> um, and really prove to them, uh, both on, on the prevention of climate change and also what steps can be taken to ameliorate the consequences for the needy. Um, we, we, we need to show that things are happening and essentially money is being delivered to those that need it. I'll stop there. Lotu and uh, Leslie, I'll come first to Lotu and then Leslie. We, we're at COP, we've just spoken about um, the, the slow pace or the glacial pace at which things are moving. You are at COP, both of you at the moment. What, what were your expectations going in? And what do you think some of the key outcomes of the event have been that will set us on the trajectory that we need to actually move things forward as opposed to talking about moving things forward? Lotu and then uh, Leslie, please. I think there's a lot of conversations going on, uh, you know, uh, talking about, you know, financing. As my experience when I was in my prior capacity, since COP1 up to COP25, uh, I think, this is, last year and this year was the first time to have the focus on financing. The first, I mean, the, more than 20 years ago, uh, and the focus was all basically focused on negotiation and the science. So I'm glad you know, there were about four cops that I attended before, and I just hit the fact back then because the focus was all about science, 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 science. Until Fiji became the presidency of the COP last year, yeah, last year or the year before last. So that's when the conversations about financing were start to gain some sort of momentum in, in different uh, levels, I think. So my expectation for this COP, I was happy simply because I've heard a lot of conversation about financing, you know, the crop of seal launching, it's more like trying to look at financial instruments or mechanisms that will provide the needed resource to close the gap when it comes to loss and damage, when it comes to insurance and using the mechanisms already exist and the crop of seals provide resources to strengthen that and so that we can take off on the ground and be able to change or protect uh, the, the lives of the people. So that was my expectations. And then to also use that, this opportunity in, here in the COP to connect. You know, I met with Leslie before, I met Isaac already and, and Gary, but you know, seeing each other here in the COP, it's it gives you some sort of a strength because you tend to introduce Leslie, hey, look, this is the equivalent of Pico in the Pacific, he's the CEO. So there is, because people in the Pacific are still thinking, we are working in silo or this is the only company in the world. I always emphasize that in my regional talk saying, no, there are four facilities in the world, but yet to have that visibility, that global visibility, because maybe next year, that's something that we have to consider having a side event, share the costs and be able to bring people to focus and have this conversation so that they know this facility exists in the regions to facilitate the 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 you know the fight against the impact of climate change and we are exist as one of the instrument we're not going to resolve i mean we're not going to address the disaster finance issue in the region if we being established the only institutions to address that no we have to cooperate with others and being in the co-op meaning you cooperate with others we connect with your potential partners i think potential organization to see if they can help out in terms of not to offer you resources in terms of money but to offer resources in terms of 
educational platform, you know, to help people on the ground understand where we are. And I think that there was, I, I, I'm happy with, with where I am now because I can be able to leverage from the experience of art organization in, in this space, because that's also going to clear the confusions on the ground. There's a lot have been done so far from my, from the from our side in terms of the work that we are offering to the Pacific, but there's a lot to be done in, in terms of trying to change this mindset. And, and you cannot done that overnight. It has to go through some sort of educational, comprehensive educational strategy to make sure that what you are changing in the mindset it can be well embedded going forward. And that's the sustainability issue. So I guess I'm happy with where we are now and that were my expectations, it, um, it met with my expectations before flying into the COP. And I'm sure maybe the same with Isaac and Leslie. But let's use this platform as something that can bring us together in a larger event for the next COP where we can start visualizing, I mean, uh, portraying that we are existing in the world and we are cooperating to the, the, that what we are providing to the countries is to help them protect their financial means so that they can be able to build resilient to shield themselves from the loss and damage created by climate change. Thank you a lot, Leslie. Yeah, so uh, I, I will try to answer the question at uh, maybe many levels. Uh, so what stood out to me at this particular COP is that there's been a real shift from just ambition uh, to action. I would characterize this as an action-oriented uh, uh, COP. Uh, there have been a lot of discussions in terms of having a real accountability uh, for progress, right? So in all the previous COPs, we've had major uh, announcements uh, including this uh, famous $100 billion uh, per year that's been promised to developing uh, countries. And the conversations this year have been around, out of that, you know, how much has been actually dispersed, uh, in which sectors, and also, as Lot was uh, pointing out, it's moving uh, from just talking about what needs to be done, but also how it's going to be done as well as uh, how it's going to be uh, how it's going to be financed so it's really seems to me at least to be moving uh, into a more implementation uh, 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 focused uh, direction uh, which is great because uh, there isn't much debate about uh, that uh, climate change is real and what needs to be done uh, for mitigation and adaptation I think now the focus needs to squarely move to uh, uh, to doing also, the other observation that I uh, made, you know, uh, in contrast to other COPs, uh, I have seen much greater representation of young people and indigenous communities uh, as well at the COP. Uh, they've all had uh, platforms, you know, at the major uh, events. And this also uh, starts to make the COP a lot more inclusive, right? It's not just about world leaders making big pronouncements, but it's also a hearing from the people that are uh, uh, affected uh, by, uh, uh, by climate uh, change. On a more personal uh, level, uh, it was a wonderful uh, opportunity to meet all our major stake stakeholders, uh, starting with our member states, the African governments. Uh, all uh, our member states have a very high level uh, representation at the COP. Uh, the African countries came together to set up an Africa uh, pavilion, which made it easy just to meet and exchange uh, with all the people that we usually interact with. I also spent uh, a lot of time with our uh, donor and developmental finance uh, partners who are critical to what we do in terms of uh, providing premium subsidies, but also capital uh, for the risk transfer uh, activities. And uh, finally, it was also the opportunity to meet with the wider uh, insurance uh, and reinsurance uh, industry under the auspices of the Insurance Development uh, uh, Forum. So in the uh, one and a half weeks that I've been here, I've basically met everyone that it would otherwise take me six months of continuous travel uh, to meet. And maybe to conclude by saying that uh, while, while I've been at the COP, uh, we've had some really tangible uh, achievements. 
So we have been able to sign uh, uh, off on the uh, memorandum of understanding uh, between all the risk pools, which is the next level for our uh, collaboration and the way we strengthen and build each other going forward. Uh, we launched the flood insurance program for uh, the state of Lagos in Nigeria, which is a partnership between uh, the Insurance Development Forum, the state government of Nigeria, as well as the uh, Insurance Solutions uh, Fund. So again, it's been three years of work and finally we launched it uh, at the COP. And uh, as you mentioned, Natalia, I also attended the launch of the Global uh, Shield which again has been a project that has been uh, a long time in the making and uh, it finally gets launched. And I believe that it's going to transform the disaster risk financing uh, landscape. So in addition to obviously all the other high level pronouncements, but uh, this is what has stood out uh, for, for me. Thank you. Oh, a bumper cup, Leslie, bumper cup. Isaac, last word to you. And Leslie was talking about the MOU with the risk pools. Um, I wondered if you wouldn't mind leaning in and telling us why this is important um, to you and to the organization that you represent. Yeah, absolutely important. Um, and you know, CRIF was actually the first uh, multi-country risk pool um, which came into operation in, in the year 2007. And then the ARC came in and subsequently uh, the others like Big Creek and, and, and the, the one in Southeast Asia. Um, the reality is that um, there's so much that we can actually do to be able to improve you know, the risk pools and help them to achieve their mandate. Um, we all have our strengths and we, of course we have our weaknesses, but there's no question that if we collaborate, you know, we can actually do a lot more. So this whole MOU, is really seeking to establish a, a framework for cooperation among the, the various um, risk pools. And as already been pointed out, uh, we can certainly um, cooperate in the area of, for example, developing um, and sharing best practices in a number of areas, including parametric insurance models, um, introducing innovative disaster risk financing instruments. And I want to make the point as well, as we talk about the Global Shield, um, that one of the things that I'm really looking for uh, in, in this particular initiative is to help scale up, you not just insurance, but other forms of disaster risk financing instrument. And I think it will be important um, that if that the, the, the various risk pools can work collaboratively in and engaging, you know, with the global risk, um, the global shield in order to be able to be able to ensure that the role of the risk pools are recognized in that in that particular effort. Uh, they, they have generally been very successful, but there's a lot more that we can do if we work together. We're also looking to see how we can um, collaborate um, on, for example, um, best practice in, in data management, sharing of information, um, undertaking joint communication, including advocacy, uh, capacity building, um, training, and so on. And, and just a range of issues. And I think, uh, and of course, not to forget the, the possibility or the potential for even doing joint um, reinsurance as, as risk pools. So I'm really excited about the prospect of working um, with our colleague risk pools, uh, with Leslie, of course, um, of ARC, um, Lotu of Pickrick, and of course, we have um, um, Gary of, 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 the, of, the, um, of, of the Southeast Asia pool. Uh, very exciting time. Um, I think we it's an opportunity for us to be able to, to take those risk pools to the next level and not just be seen as just uh, insurance and mechanisms for transferring risk, but also helping to scale up disaster risk financing in a very significant way. One advantage that we have, um, perhaps uh, many other multilaterals do not, is that we've been really been able to build an excellent relationship with our governments, and I do still recognize some of the challenges that Lotu is having in in um in in the South Pacific, but I'm sure he's going to overcome that with time. And maybe that collaboration that we are looking to develop is going to help Lotu help get that message across to all the other um, member governments how important it is, you know, to to make sure that they manage the risk and they take a proactive uh, role in helping to effectively address 
climate risk and climate change and so on. So we're all very excited about this, and I'm really happy that um, to be that my organization is part of this initiative. And pleased to join Leslie and the others in announcing the fact that we've been able to sign this MOU and we'll be looking to, to work in a more structured way. Of course, we've been working um, over the year. We've been, we've been talking, uh, we've been engaging, but this MOU will help bring some structure and some more formality in the process as we look to, to scale up the activities for the interests of not just the risk pool, but for the countries and the people that we serve. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me to unpack how the risk pools you represent are an innovative and LOTU proactive mechanism that have certainly shown their relevance in this age of increasing climate change field events and for all the work um, that you are doing to protect the most vulnerable to climate change. Thank you so much for your time and uh, wishing you all a wonderful rest of the COP27. Thank you very much.